good morning. I hope um, everybody's all right. Okay. <coughs> yeah, it's a picture from last year. So I'm I'm really really happy to be here. It was a really fun conference last year, and I'm really glad to to be here speaking today, and sharing my my experience. Uh, to help with my nervousness a little, I, I wonder what would Aaron Patterson do, and <laughs> before he talks, he wonders what would Freddie Mercury do. <laughs> I don't know if that helps, but um, anyway, the show must go on. So um, I'd really love to to work like GitHub, doing only things that we are passionate about, with goals and no deadline. I love I would love to practice agile. Uh, like uh, Pivotal Labs, extreme programming all the way. I'd love to do things like uh, 77 Signals, working on products with amazing design and polished user experience. But that's not always possible, at least not at the beginning. For four years, I've been part of a team of crazy people who think they can start from nothing and grow a business by bringing value in a market occupied by giants. Today, the team is barely the same, but we've grown from a, a simple prototype to a dozen of web applications, all serving our users' interests. We, we haven't achieved the level of excellence we were hoping, but we might have done more, faster, if we were able to work that efficiently, but we've done it anyway. Today, I'll try to convince you that even if you're not up to your models, with the right people and the right state of mind, you can do great things. So my name is Jeremy Lecourt. I work on hotelhotel.com. It's a website that helps you choose the right hotel and book it at the best price. It's based on rails and a ton of cool technologies built by great people with ambitious goals. At the beginning, there was nothing, just a few people and a ton of ideas. None of us is a big player. We're just a bunch of amateurs, far away from the best. But we are used to operate in many fields. Sorry. And when you have no world-class expert on board and no money to hire some, you have to step up and do all the things by yourself and there is a lot to do. On the development side of things, I can see four main roles that need to be taken care of. First, there is the architect. You notice the Batmobile? <laughs> he designed the system and he chose the technologies. Are we going to choose cloud or VPS or bare metal servers? Use Rails 3, stable, or Rails 4 in beta? MySQL or PostgreSQL? A single Rails app or SOA from the beginning? That kind of questions. And since everybody wants to move fast, he has to choose from well known technologies or take chances with new stuff. Then comes the builder. He's the one with the tools and the blueprint. He has to build the machine up to the last bolt. From servers and operating system, from JavaScript and HTML to CSS, all the Rails stuff and also dealing with crappy third-party APIs. This is the biggest role of the four. The rocket surgeon. He's dealing with a running machine, diving deep into very specific areas that need to be fine-tuned. It's often about performance, and it takes a lot of time to go beyond the first level of knowledge to find ways to improve critical parts. You know, when you have 200 million records in your database, you've got to tweak the default configuration. When you want to reduce the number of HTTP requests, and you have already applied every common suggestion and recommendation, and using a profiler to shave off some percents of the rendering time is not that what we usually do before breakfast. And finally, there are the firefighter or the plumber. When shit hits the fan, you've got to reach for the switch, and quickly. When a process goes rogue and fills up a terabyte partition in a few hours, 
like on this graph. When a bad deploy prevents the worker, all the workers from restarting, or when you truncate the wrong table, I know you did it, at least one of you, I did. You know what I'm talking about. And when something like that happens, no matter what you are doing, you've got to drop it and get on the deck. A sufficiently motivated and capable developer can wear any of these hats. But wearing many of them at the same time and switching between them every week, every day of the week, is hard and exhausting. And we can't just go shopping. The worst is that there is no job description to hire someone capable of that. There is no degree to teach that either. And in order to maintain our motivation, we had to accept that not all of this could be done perfectly. Otherwise, some wouldn't be done at all. It is very frustrating, but knowing that it keeps the boat afloat and moving to the right direction really helps. There is a good thing about the software industry, and the web in particular. Compared to other industries, it's quite easy to change and evolve. We don't need a year-long process to change of HTTP servers or move data between databases. Combine that with the need to operate fast on constantly evolving project, and it becomes difficult to make big commitments to a specific piece of technology. We prefer not to spend many weeks searching and vetting technologies to use for a particular job. We are always reading and hacking on new things, so when we need to, we can make quick and educated choices, and we are not afraid of ditching something when it no longer fits. Let me tell you with a little bit more details how and why we've changed one of the main data stores, and we did it three times. The reason we exist, Hotel Hotel, is that many merchants are selling the same hotels and we can compare the, price, the prices they have. That's what makes you pay less for the same room if you book it at the right merchant coming through our website. For example, if you search for a hotel in Paris, say next, next Friday, one night, two people, we have almost, most of them, 2,000 hotels, to look for at 17 merchants. That's at least 30 external requests, bringing back 20,000 prices managed by 15 threads. And all of this takes from 30 to 90 seconds to complete in the background. When we began, we were using a MySQL database. It was working quite well for regular cities with dozens of hotels. But for big cities with hundreds or even thousands, it was already slower. To display uh, a page of results, we need to group the prices by hotel ID with the best price per hotel, then sort those prices, then we can paginate, and finally get the hotel general information and build a page. It must take place during the user's request, and very few of these can be cached. When the traffic went up, with the business growing, every search became slower and slower every week. The problem was about massive inserts at the beginning of the search and a lot of complicated selects at each page refresh. Optimizing the MySQL database was no longer an option, and it was time for a change. MongoDB looked like a good candidate. A user search would be stored in a single document with a common schema but viable number of hotels and merchants per hotel. The business format allowed to insert prices at a specific place in the data tree. On the testing setup, the performance was amazing. So we quickly put this into production, and it's been fantastic for more than a year. Our workers were able to write synchronously on the same document, and Rails was fetching the full document very rapidly. But the traffic went up again, and MongoDB began to freak out under load. What used to be very fast, even fine queries on the primary key, were taking hundreds of milliseconds. And after a couple of weeks of digging, I've come to the conclusion that MongoDB doesn't handle very well collections with documents of various sizes and lots of concurrent reads and writes 
on the same document. It is locking the database 99% of the time, which is not what you want. We've managed to mitigate the issue and bring things back to normal with some configuration adjustments and also moving MongoDB to, to dedicated hardware. But it was clear that it wouldn't be long before it's not enough. We had to look for something else. Uh, I've even tried to replace it with Redis. It's been almost three weeks of work to change the code, and it's been in production for less than a day. It failed spectacularly. <laughs> as much as I love Redis, and we use it a lot with great benefit, it's a great product and a great database, but it was not a good fit for those needs. So we rolled back to MongoDB, and we moved on. I was already having an eye on Elasticsearch, and it seemed to be able to deal with a lot of concurrent writes and reads at the same time, thanks to its Lucene foundation. For a couple of months, we've been gradually migrating some pieces of our system on a new app, which uses Elasticsearch as its main data store, and frankly, it's working very well. Elasticsearch really seems to be a great product with awesome features and a lot of potential. You should definitely give it a try. The important part here is not that we move from MySQL to MongoDB to Elasticsearch. They are all great products with great use cases. But it's that we have started with what was a good tool, then changed it when it no longer was for the need, not in itself. Each time we've done that, it took us quite some time to do so, but we've gained experience and knowledge about our domain model, our needs and constraints. And each time, the decision was based on previous experiences, and the new setup was more capable and helped us grow bigger. In the end, it's sure I know a lot more about MySQL, MongoDB, and Elasticsearch. And I don't think it was a waste of time. Speaking of time, people often are surprised by the amount of time we spend learning, trying, and hacking on stuff, even if we're always late on deadlines and adding more to the backlog than we moved from it, removed from it. One might say that it, we spend all this precious time and it goes against our immediate productivity. There is some truth in that, but it's short-sighted because that's what makes us prepared for quick moves when we need to. Speaking of time, people are often surprised. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, in the Ruby community, we are familiar with pair programming. Some people still think that it's a waste of time, but we so much think that it's not, that we are spending most of our Friday afternoons doing team learning, like pair programming, but the three or four of us. It's about 15% of our regular work week, dedicated to discussing books we've read, reading and commenting, the source code of Rails or other gems we use. We also watch a lot of screencasts, and discuss how we could translate those ideas into our code base. And it's a very pleasant way to end the week with positive attitude, reduce pressure, and in the end, it's also very productive. So much knowledge and great ideas come from this. It's also important to remember that there is a life outside of the team. I love going to conferences like this a couple of times a year, and I also love to be involved in local communities. I'm looking forward to what um, PJ has to tell about this. Go to users group if there are storms around you. And if there are not, you can create one. It's really easy. You, you can talk to David about this. He created, um, yeah, he's there. He created uh, Pastis RB, a Ruby brigade in Marseille. You can go to, you can go to or facilitate code retreats or coding dojo. And con contributing to open source projects is also a very good way to learn useful things and meet new people. But how can you apply this in our day-to-day -day work and benefit from it? We're back to the human factor and to soft skills that are complementary to what's on a resume. If you want your teammates to put their skin in the game and act like they care, you've got to look for those skills. 
and there are a few that I'm thinking of. First, passionate. It's a big word, yeah. What do you do when you're passionate about something? You spend a lot of time on it, you think about it all the time, when you wake up, when you take a shower, when you commute, when you ride your bike, at least that's what I do. I can't help it. And being passionate about my job, it's natural to spend some personal time reading technical books, watching screencasts, and trying new gems and practices. But don't get me wrong, I'm not for crazy hours of work, neglecting family, friends, and hobbies. We're not factories. I just, I just think that passionate people care about what they do. They value the, the result more than being at a desk, doing, at what, doing what they're told. Self-driven is another one. I really hate having a boss behind my back tell me, telling me what to do and how to do it. And being kind of responsible for the rest of the team, I hate even more having to do this to my coworkers. Autonomy might be the best way I know to reduce the management part of the job. Grace Hopper said, you manage things, you lead people. And the time I don't spend micromanaging people makes me available for more important and productive tasks. Open-minded is also very important. In our company, everyone has a very different background. We often bring issues to each other to have external input. The key attitude here is empathy, empathy and ability to listen, especially when two people don't speak the same jargon and have different expectations. I can count how many times someone completely ignorant of the specifics of my problem puts me back on track with a naive question or a new angle. Once again, the behavior and state of mind of people in the company are the most important thing. At least, I think so. That's the fuel for motivation and what helps overcome the challenges. And it can be even more efficient with some agile practices. For me, agile is um, it's both about human and technology. I think of it as a set of guidelines and practices designed to optimize the feedback loop and help make right, the right decisions. I've always cared about great tools and efficient workflow, but I've never practiced Agile rigorously. The best we've managed to do so far is cherry-picking low-hanging fruits from all those schools of Agile. For example, we don't do formal stand-up meetings, but we check on each other at least two or three times a week. Everybody's always aware of what everybody's status is. What feature are they working on? Are they doing fine? Are they having issues? Can we help? We do pair programming as much as we can, a few hours each week. Especially for knowledge sharing, working on critical code, and of course, having fun. One of the upsides of being a small team is that we can try new practices and adjust the workflow on the go. We've always been versioning our code, but being really interested in this, I've tried to apply the Git flow model to one of our apps. After a couple of weeks, I thought it was good enough to use in other projects. Once mo one month later, and everyone was using it. Fast forward a few months, and we felt the pain of its rigidity with web project. So we've decided to keep it, but simplify it. There was no need to have a long meeting about this or get the big boss approval. We just did it. As long as you don't break the, the team's dynamics by changing too much, too often, you can iterate and refine your process incrementally. There is a word I like a lot that summarizes quite well what I think about this. It's empirical. Something that is empirical is based on, concerned with, or verifiable by observation of experience rather than theory or pure logic. And empiricism is a theory that all knowledge is based on experience derived from the senses. Our story is certainly not, certainly not a perfect model. I think that we could have done 
better if we were more disciplined. But I'm convinced that constantly aiming higher and improving gradually all aspects of the work leads to great success. Since day one, everyone in our company is on the same page. We are painting the same picture, knowing how hard the challenge is, and we are open to changes. Those four years have been the most intense of my professional life, but it's, it's also the most rewarding and satisfying. Cool technologies and other geek geeky stuff are certainly part of it, but the human part is the most important for me. And I'm really proud to work with such awesome people. They have notably helped me go past my urges to control everything and achieve perfection. I will leave you with this quote from Dave Thomas. You don't have to be perfect, you just have to survive. And along the way, remember that the reason you're doing it is to make it fun. Thank you. I think we have some time left. Yeah. So, any question? Thank you, Jeremy, for the talk. It was, uh, it yeah, was really fascinating. Um, I'm interested in the, uh, the Learning Friday is fantastic, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but that's not what my question is about. Um, when you said that you, um, you know what each other is doing, um, but you don't do stand-up meetings, yeah. can I ask you to sort of uh, give us a, a few ideas about how how you guys share that knowledge and status um, without doing stand-up meetings. Yeah, okay. We are not doing stand-up meetings in a formal way, but um, we are three, three main developers in the, in the tech team and about uh, seven or eight people in the company. Um, two of us are in Marseille, in the office, and, and one of us is uh, remote. And uh, we... We spend quite some time in Skype or Google Hangout. And even sometimes uh, for two, three, four, six hours long, we have a webcam, a mic connected with the other guy. And we just know we're here. It's like virtual, virtual presence. And uh, just like if we were in the same office. So uh, three of us in the same room, it's quite easy to, to know when someone is cursing about the code or... or uh, I don't know, very enthusiastic about, uh, yeah, I've done it, it's okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's easy to share. Um, we have some, yes, it's like a, it's like a water cooler or, or coffee machine, we, we, we share a lot. We also have um, uh, uh, a chat room for everyone to share uh, good news, uh, uh, funny pictures of cats, uh, or just a regular, uh, regular chat uh, about uh, everything. Um, what are we doing to, uh, to so I don't know, uh, Google Hangout is, uh, is really great for that. Uh, thank you. Another question? Yeah, please, shoot for questions. <laughs> oh. Okay. So thank you, Jeremy. Okay, thank you. Uh, please, uh, like like Fabian said, it's uh, it's it's just the beginning. Uh, I have, a, I'm a, a lot of. I'm very enthusiastic about my my work. How we work, how we do things, and I can talk for hours. <laughs> I can't hear, but I I, I sure I sure appreciate. So if you if you want, we we can talk all the day about talk about, uh, it, about yeah. this. Thank you. Thank you.